six, six, six. Beware, billions bow before beast. We live in one of the mad moments of history. We're in a computerized age and a psychedelic society. Beginning with the first family upon the earth, mankind has been in competition with other human beings. But our generation finds itself also in competition with hydraulic, mechanical, and electronic devices. Science fiction from past decades has become a reality in our generation. With our genius, inventive minds, we've created mighty mechanical Frankensteins which pose a threat to the entire human race. Curious people the world over are asking for an explanation to the many strange happenings in the world today. All efforts to explain away the frequent sightings of unidentified flying objects in recent months has not been successful. Politicians, Air Force pilots, law enforcement agents, and even scientists refuse to accept the overly simplified explanations by those who are in authority attempting to ward off a panic. Without question, signs and wonders are being seen in the heavens today. What does it all mean? Well, I'm a very practical person and therefore do not choose to shoot a speculative bow at a venture. I would like, however, to present some simple facts for your consideration. While I may not be dogmatic on every issue, there will be absolutely no ambiguity in any statement made. Documentation by scriptures or other reliable sources will be presented. I prayerfully trust that no one will pass swift judgment upon what I'm about to say. Every remark will be made in love, and I hope they will be accepted accordingly. Shortly after the rapture of the church takes place, an image of the Antichrist will be made. All those who refuse to bow down and worship the image will be killed. Those who do worship the image will be given the privilege of buying and selling through the medium of a mark, which will be given on the right hand or on the forehead. The mark will consist of two things, the name of the Antichrist or the number which corresponds to his name. The supervision of the giving of the mark will be conducted by the false prophet. Now without this mark, nobody will buy or sell anything. And those taking the mark, God says, will have their souls damned. All the people on the earth after the rapture are to be regimented and controlled by Satan through his Antichrist and the Antichrist attendant helper, namely the false prophet. Toward this end, Satan is to control all politics. The word of God puts it this way. And he, that is the Antichrist, was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation, according to Revelation 13 and 7. Now the Bible also clearly indicates that Antichrist will control all religions, all of the inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not from the foundation of the world been written in the slain Lamb's book of life, will worship him, that is, the Antichrist, according to Revelation 13 and verse 8. The false prophet exercises all the full authority of the Antichrist on his behalf. He makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the Antichrist, according to verse 12 of Revelation 13. Also, the Bible teaches the Antichrist is to control all commerce. The scripture puts it this way. The false prophet makes everyone high and low, rich and poor, employer and employee have a mark stamped on their right hand or on their foreheads and permits no one to buy or sell anything unless he bears the mark, that is, the Antichrist name or the number corresponding to his name. There is wisdom hidden here. Let everyone of intelligence calculate the Antichrist number, for it indicates a certain man, and his number is 666, according to Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 through 18. We know that the false prophet will be a pope through the comparison of the Vatican City with the 17th chapter of the book of the Revelation. The apostate church will consist of many members, however, from all apostate religion and all denominations, 
one world church will be formed under the then existing pope. The false prophet is described in verse 1 of that chapter as being seated on many waters. And in verse 15, these waters are described as being peoples and multitudes, nations and languages, over which the idolatrous woman or the Vatican rules. Well, Roman Catholics today are all over the world. As a matter of fact, the very name means universal. And then in verse 2, the Vatican City is spoken of as the great idolatrous. We know the Vatican City is the greatest maker of idols in the world today. Again, in verse 2, we are told that the kings of the earth have joined with this idolatrous woman in her idolatry. History tells us that the kings of Europe have in the past bought indulgences from the popes. Also in verse 2, we are told the inhabitants of the world are described as being intoxicated with the wine of the woman's idolatry. Columbia Encyclopedia describes in detail how Catholic priests claim to be imbued with power from God to forgive sins. Roman Catholics leave their confessional boxes intoxicated with happiness because of their forgiveness by the priest. Now in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 3, John said that he was carried away in a trance to a high desert land. Now Italy is 99% Roman Catholic. It is also a desert of spirituality. Roman Catholics practice the doctrines of devils, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, according to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Many of her practices resulted from embracing paganism without conversion. Now, that does not mean that all Catholics are now lost, nor does it mean that we're not to love and to labor to win them. Many today are hungry for the truth. The idolatrous woman is described as being seated on a scarlet animal, all covered with blasphemous titles. It had seven heads and ten horns, according to verse 3 of Revelation chapter 17. Now, this scarlet animal is the resurrected Antichrist, who is, according to verse 11, the eighth king, but he is also one of the seven. The Bible does not use double talk in such instances. We need definite divine revelation, however, to understand. All of these seven heads, which are seven Roman Caesars, which includes the Antichrist, took unto themselves blasphemous titles. This is also emphasized in Revelation 13 and verse 1. History shows us that six Roman Caesars in succession took unto themselves blasphemous titles. This began with Caesar Augustus, who took for his title Lord and God, worthy of worship. At his death in A.D. 14, he was followed by five other Caesars who took unto themselves blasphemous titles, namely Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, and Vespasian. Now the latter died in A.D. 79, and on his death, these blasphemous titles were discontinued. John is now on the Isle of Patmos writing the book of the Revelation or the Apocalypse, the last book in the Word of God. The Isle of Patmos was a Roman possession. John said there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is reigning while I'm writing. The other, that is, the Antichrist, has not yet come. But when he comes, he must reign for a short space of time. He is also an eighth king resurrected, though he is one of the seven according to Revelation 17 and verse 11. Then we find the Antichrist blasphemy described in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4, where he's described as entering God's sanctuary and taking his seat there, proclaiming himself to be God. This gives us our seven heads with blasphemous titles. Now the ten horns are ten countries out of the old Roman Empire, and are represented by Nebuchadnezzar's image as the ten toes. Five toes are in the western part of Europe, and five toes are in the eastern part of Europe. These ten are to form a union, and according to Daniel 7.24, after the formation of these ten nations, then the Antichrist is to appear. We see the false prophet, which is the Vatican, seated on the Roman Empire, which will be temporarily revived by the seventh head, namely the Antichrist, backed up and assisted by the ten horns, who are the ten nations, who will give their power and their strength unto the Antichrist. And this is spelled out clearly in Revelation 17, 
verses 12 and 13. But coming back to the false prophet, namely the Vatican City, who is described as being seated upon this beast having seven heads covered with blasphemous titles and ten horns, this means that this woman, the Vatican City, is dominating this beast, which is the revived Roman Empire. We see that this has been true even in the past and is also even true today. Italy in 1948 voted that Roman Catholicism is the national religion for that country and that no citizen must speak disrespectfully of the Pope or he will suffer the consequences. This domination by the Vatican City over the revived Roman Empire is to increase to such an extent that the ten nations will become infuriated with her and annihilate her completely in the end. God's Word says the ten horns that you saw and the Antichrist will hate the idolatrous woman which is the Vatican City and make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her up with fire, according to verse 16 of Revelation 17. The thing which will cause this to come to pass will be the fact that the false prophet, because of his supposed non-political position, will be placed at the head of the universal rationing, all of which will be controlled by the mark. And this is clearly spelled out in verses 11 through 17 of the 13th chapter of Revelation. Obviously, the present ecumenical drive is going to eventually try to force everybody into one universal church by using this power of granting the mark to favor the one world religion and those who will become a part of the vast religious program. It is this favoritism which is going to cause the ten nations and the Antichrist to become angry with the false prophet, which is the Vatican. The result will be its destruction, according to Revelation 17, verses 16 and 17. Now this is the work of Satan, of course, so as to cause the eyes of the world to be upon the Antichrist and not on the Vatican. It is at this time that the Antichrist will then move his headquarters from Rome to Jerusalem, where the Jews will have been conducting their sacrificial worship in full liberty and freedom. But upon the arrival of the Antichrist in Jerusalem, this sacrifice will be discontinued by the Antichrist's command. The Word of God puts it this way in Daniel chapter 9. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And then our Lord said in Matthew 24, verses 15 and 16, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee under the mountains. The giving of the mark is a part of the great tribulation. The true church, of course, is not going to go through the tribulation or even any part of it. We are to escape all these things which shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man in the rapture, according to Luke chapter 21 and verse 36. Also, because thou hast kept the words of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour, which is the great tribulation, that will come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the face of the whole earth, according to Revelation 3.10. Now, if the mark were given while we Christians were upon the earth, that would mean that we would have to starve to death because as Christians we could not take the mark. So it must be given after we go to be with the Lord in the rapture. Please notice the tie-in of the Antichrist image with this mark. Now, the Word of God says this, the false prophet is also allowed to impart life to the Antichrist statue so that the Antichrist statue can speak and to have all who do not worship the Antichrist statue killed. And please notice the conjunction it, which means the false prophet makes everyone, high and low, rich and poor, employer and employee, have a mark stamped on their right hands or on their foreheads and permits no one to buy or sell anything unless he bears the mark that is, the Antichrist's name or the number corresponding to his name. That's according to the American translation of Revelation 13, verses 13 through 17. So we see the worship of the image of the Antichrist and the mark of the Antichrist are tied together. All those who do not worship the image are killed. 
The people who will be receiving the mark are those who have worshipped the image of the Antichrist and do not wish to starve to death. Our computerized world may be much closer to the Antichrist reign than anyone would ever realize. Without the computer, our astronauts would never have been able to perform their space missions. For example, in April of 1970, the U.S. Apollo 13 mission was suddenly aborted and the decision made to bring the crippled ship back to the Earth. It took scientists working with computers only 84 minutes to figure the correct return path to the Earth. How long do you suppose it would have taken a mathematical brain to do this? Well, NASA figures it would have taken one man using just pencil and paper more than a million years to perform the task. With a desk calculator, a man could have performed this service in only 60,000 years, they say. And NASA states had all the people in the Mission Planning Analysis Division at the time, a total of 220, been assigned the task of working out the formula with desk calculators, they might have come up with the right answers in one generation. But with the modern computer, the task was performed in only one and one-half hours. Now computers are being designed to carry out spacecraft billions of miles from Earth to the very edge of the solar system. But it's admitted that even the most reliable of contemporary computers would surely suffer a failure of some of its components long before the end of such missions. Scientists are literally exhausting themselves in their effort to produce component parts that will endure the intensive heat and endure the extensive flight. Now we understand that the computers can do almost anything, but we doubt if it can tell us when Christ will return, because the Word of God says, No man knoweth the day nor the hour. It's reported there's computers which can make three million calculations a second. Think of it. The electronic computer has completely revolutionized the scientific world. The computer appears to be a lifeless hunk of metal and circuitry with miles of tiny wires crisscrossing each other, but feed into it the right information and it will come up with the right answer almost every time. No doubt it will be the one single device used by the Antichrist who is seen erecting an image that can both speak and also single out those who are not loyal followers of his program. Because we read in Revelation 13 and verse 15 that he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Doesn't that sound like the work of a giant computer? Doesn't that remind you of a walking, talking robot computer? A popular magazine once carried an article on Shaky the first electronic person. Computer scientist Charles Rosen built a complex machine that could think with the intelligence of the average person. For example, fed into shaky computer's brain was the instruction, push the block off the platform. Immediately the mind in this machine began to work, and shaky seemed to look around the room and then slowly turn to the exit and down the corridor at about four miles an hour. At every open door, Shaky stopped, turned his head, inspected the room, turned away, and rolled on to the next open door. In the fourth room, he finally saw what he was looking for, a platform one foot high and about eight foot long with a large wooden block sitting on it. For about five seconds, the mechanical man stared at the platform. He realized he could not climb aboard the platform for his wheels were too small. Looking about the room, his head rotating slowly, he saw a shallow ramp lying on the floor on the other side of the room. Briskly he turned, crossed the ramp, semi-circled it, and then pushed it straight across the floor till the high end of the ramp hit the platform. Then Shaky rolled back a few feet, casing the situation again, discovering that only one corner of the ramp was touching the platform. Rolling quickly to the far side of the ramp, he nudged it again and again until the gap was closed. Then he swung around, charged up the slope, located the block, and gently pushed it off the platform. Amazing, isn't it? Shaky, the computer, is called the fascinating and fearsome reality of a machine with a mind of its own. Computers have been known to make mistakes, however, or shall we say errors in judgment. A computer accurately handles information fed into its brain, but it may come up with some wrong information occasionally. Take the computer with a 4,000-word vocabulary 
such as the one that was developed and used by Lieutenant Colonel Vernon Walters, U.S. interpreter for many international conferences. While Colonel Walters watched this computer brain was fed the phrase from the Bible where our Lord said to his disciples, The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now understand, this electronic brain could translate into another language. So when these words were fed into this computer, the machine translated as follows. The liquor is good, but the meat has gone bad. Well, certainly no translator of the Word of God would be satisfied with such a translation as that. Computers are being used in the study of the Scriptures today, and according to a Scottish clergyman, A.Q. Morton, the computer claims the Apostle Paul wrote only Galatians, Romans, the First Corinthians, and Philemon, which is just five of the fourteen New Testament books traditionally attributed to him. The two tests given to Paul's epistles to determine whether he wrote them are the length of the sentences and the use of certain words. But the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Computers may be reliable when it comes to mathematical formulas and solving such complex questions and problems. But we doubt the reliability of any theological interpretation that may result from its study of the Word. As the natural man receiveth not the things of God, neither can know or understand them apart from the Holy Spirit, so says the Word of God. Well, then we must accept the fact that a computer cannot truly determine such things as the author or authenticity of the books of the Bible. Several years ago in Seattle, Washington, a computer programmer became angry over the computations produced by his computer and promptly pumped four 38 caliber bullets into the machine. There have been cases of misuse of computers also that are classic examples in showing what can be done with such machines. In Los Angeles, a 21-year-old businessman built the telephone and telegraph company out of more than a million dollars in equipment by cracking the computerized ordering code and having equipment shipped to his own firm instead. In Georgia, a banker was convicted of using the services of a computer to embezzle over four million dollars. Well, what will happen when the Antichrist directs a computer with the ability to answer any question in a fraction of time? With the computer, he can always come up with the right answers with which to rule the world. Listen to what we read in the book of the Revelation that will one day take place. Revelation 13 and verse 16 says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. How dreadfully close might we be to that day when this will happen. A newspaper article announced the unveiling of a giant computer in Brussels, the capital of the common market countries. Dr. Hendrik Edelman, chief analyst of the Common Market Confederacy, announced from Brussels that a computerized restoration plan is underway and scientists, advisors, and CMC leaders were on hand for the unveiling of the great beast. The beast is a gigantic computer that takes up three full floors of the administration building at market headquarters. This giant computer is said to be a self-programming unit that has over 100 sensing input sources. According to this news article, the computer would make use of a master plan involving a digital number system for every human on the earth. The computer would assign each citizen of the world a number to use for all buying and selling to avoid the problems of ordinary credit cards. The number would be invisibly lacer tattooed on the forehead or the back of the hand. It would provide a walking credit card system. The number would then show up under infrared scanners to be placed at all checkout counters and places of businesses. This article is most significant, and we may be much closer to the coming of the Lord than we ever dreamed or thought. 
Before leaving the Bahama Islands recently, I experienced a very similar thing. In order to board the plane, I had to first pass under the infrared scanner, which showed up a number on my hand in invisible ink in glowing purple color. The newspapers recently carried the following release. Computer-controlled cars will speed passengers to their destination without fear of collision is now being tested in Japan. Hailed as the urban transport system of the future, the computer-controlled vehicle system should be fully operational in Tokyo, the world's largest city, before the end of the 1970s. Japanese officials explained how each rubber-tired CVS car seats up to four people in air-conditioned comfort. It travels along electronically powered pathways, finding shortcuts and avoiding jam-ups. And since it's controlled by a supercomputer that knows exactly where each car is at all times, they say it's perfectly safe. Upon entering the car, you simply punch out your destination by pressing a button and the car will take you there. Computers now affect every strata of human life. The following article I find of great interest. The United States Gold Reserve has shrunk from 28 billion 25 years ago to less than 10 billion today. President Kennedy told representatives from 102 nations at the International Monetary Fund Conference on September 30th, 1963, there was a real need for redistribution of the financial resources of the world. It did not come by chance, but by conscious and deliberate and responsible planning. It was then that the international bankers and financial experts began planning a new money system to replace the present systems. The new money systems would use computers that could control people's spending by controlling their credit. In describing this system, one expert said, instead of paying employees in money or by check, the employee would be electronically credited by means of a special telephone line. The worker's account and the local computer bank would receive the credit. When the individual goes to the market, he simply shows his account number to the cashier at the checkout stand. His account is immediately charged, but if he's overdrawn, a red light comes on. As the person passes the cashier, electronic equipment will light up in visible ink on his forehead or on his hand. These two places on a person's body will be the most logical places for the account numbers to be tattooed with a new painless tattoo gun. No money will change hands. No bill folds or purses will open. No delay. Fast, safe, and efficient. Everyone will be required to have a number, so says the article. And then the first experiment of consequence took place in 1971 at Upper Arlington, Ohio. Now I'm quoting from the December 26, 1971 edition of Parade Magazine. Can you imagine an all-day shopping trip without carrying cash or even your checkbook? Well, that's what they're doing in this central Ohio city where 31 merchants, more than 2,000 customers, and a bank are joined in pioneering experiments that are aimed at moving toward a cashless, checkless society. Says John Fisher, Columbus banker who directs the test using a computer, American banks are now processing 22 billion checks a year, and in 10 years that's likely to double. We just can't take it anymore. The Federal Reserve Board has indicated that governments might have to step in with new regulations if the banking industry cannot develop some way to reduce the load. Well, the Upper Arlington experiment, which seems to be going well, is an effort to make that reduction. As word of the test has spread through the banking circles, They've dropped in to inspect the experiment from all 50 states and from Japan, Canada, Switzerland, and West Germany. When the test period runs out here, the project will be continued and extended to include more participants throughout the world. Well, how will the number and the mark of the beast affect the average worker on his job? We have some insight into this aspect of the coming one-world economic system from a United Press release dated August 31st, 1971, which reads as follows. There's been a lot of talk about a moneyless and even a checkless society. We've seen credit cards bring about somewhat of a moneyless society, but few believe a checkless society would come about. 
but it already has in several areas. The 1,300 employees of the Sarasota, Florida Memorial Hospital haven't received a paycheck since January of 1967. At that time, the hospital instituted a checklist payroll system for its entire $280,000 biweekly payroll force, and it seems to be working well. The system keyed by a Honeywell 1259 computer works like this. Each employee is issued an identification card with his name, picture, and Social Security number when he joins the staff. When he comes to work, he inserts the card into an electronic time clock. It records the time and Social Security number and transfers the information to an automated card puncher in the computer room. The process is repeated when the employees leave work. At the end of the pay period, the computer prepares a payroll roster for each of the 14 participating banks in this program, and the payroll is delivered to the various banks with the hospital's check. Well, we had some complaints about the dehumanization when it first went in, but it's worked well, and we aren't thinking of changing, said the associate director of the 515-bed hospital. When will Christ come? When will he return? Well, I want to say, friend, that no one knows the day nor the hour. Neither can any giant computer tell us exactly when our Lord will return. We do know from God's word unprecedented chaos will prevail upon the earth. Most people today are looking to IBM rather than the inspired book for the answer to the many perplexing questions of life. Some unenlightened people might very readily ask, but what harm would there be in taking the mark just so long as you could buy and sell and sustain your life. But we must remember that this mark is being given in connection with the worship of a man, a human being, if you please. And the Word of God tells us that our God is a jealous God, and we must not bow to any graven image. God's Word strictly forbids physical markings. It says this in Leviticus 19:28. You must not make any incisions in your body for the dead, nor tattoo any marks on yourself, since I am the Lord. So we see that the taking of the mark is tied up with the worshiping of the image of the Antichrist. Revelation 14, 9 through 11 has this to say, Whosoever worships the beast and his statue and lets its mark be put on his forehead or in his right hand shall drink of the wine of God's wrath, poured unmixed into the cup of his anger and be tortured with fire and brimstone before the eyes of his holy angels and of the Lamb. And the Lord has the right to do anything he chooses, we must remember. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. Now the placing of the mark upon a person's body by God is not wrong. But whenever Satan tries to counterfeit the acts of God and places a mark upon a person's body through the medium of the false prophet, then that act is sinful and must be resisted by those who would honor God. God, in his great mercy, has had the warning placed in the Bible for the simple reason that the Bible will be on the earth after the rapture takes place and the church is in the presence of God. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted time. This is why God sends upon them a misleading influence to make them believe what is false, so that all who have refused to believe the love of the truth but have preferred disobedience may be condemned according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. But I'm glad to say that God has not withdrawn his saving grace. Even the people during the tribulation can be saved. And this is the manner in which they can be saved if they choose to go through with it. They must have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, refuse to bow before the Antichrist statue or take his mark on their body. They must give forth their testimony and permit themselves to be put to death rather than to disown Christ. During this time, the Christians are at the marriage supper of the Lamb, the greatest celebration in all of the history of the universe. While it will be possible to be saved during the tribulation, it will be well nigh impossible. Because our Lord said in Matthew chapter 24, Then they will hand you over to the persecutors, and they will put you to death, and you will be hated because you bear my name. But he who holds out to the end, that is, the end of his life, the physical life, the same shall be saved. And then Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 says, And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded on the account of their testimony for Jesus Christ and the message of God, who had refused to worship the Antichrist and his statue, and would not have his mark put on their foreheads or in their hands. 
they were restored to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And then in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, the Word of God says this, When he had broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered on account of God's message and for the adhering to his testimony. Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to be quiet for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers who were to be killed as they had been should be complete. So we see that there will be people saved during the tribulation, but they'll be saved the hard way, saved as by fire, if you please. Today, God says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, God at different times has had placed upon people marks which were visible in order to give the recipients protection and a mark of distinction. Many scriptures bear out this truth. The first one I would call your attention to is in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 15. The Lord prescribed a mark for Cain to prevent anyone who chanced upon him from hurting him. And then in Exodus chapter 12, where we have the story of God delivering Israel from bondage and servitude down in the land of Egypt. And he said, The blood will serve as a sign for you on the houses where you live, and when I see the blood I'll pass over you, so that no deadly plague will fall on you when I smite the land of Egypt. And then the word of God says in the book of the Revelation, chapter 7 again, Then I saw another angel, and he cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we mark the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I have heard that the number of those who were marked with the seal was a hundred and forty-four thousand. And then Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 4 through 6 says this, Then he called to the man and said unto him, Set a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry for all of the abominations that are done in the midst of her. And to the others he said in my hearing, Pass through the city after him and slay without mercy or pity those whom do not have the mark upon them. Now Satan wants to be like the Most High, and he tries to imitate him according to Isaiah 14, 14. And he's going to give a counterfeit by marking with a visible mark the bodies of human beings. But the Word of God says no one will buy or sell anything except they bear the name of the Antichrist or the number corresponding to that name. The unholy trinity of Satan, the devil, the false prophet, and Antichrist will attempt to imitate the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said in Matthew 24 that they'll deceive the very elect if possible. Now in the book of the Revelation we have the Beatitudes of the serious Bible student. He said, Blessed is he that readeth, blessed is he that heareth, and blessed is he that understandeth. But Daniel 12 and 10 says that none of the wicked shall understand, only the wise shall understand. But in the epistle of James, chapter 1, verse 5, we are told that if any one of you is deficient in wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth generously to every one. And then in John's gospel, chapter 16 and verse 13, we are told that the Holy Spirit will announce to you the things that are to come. Because of these passages of Scripture, one can readily see that there is no excuse for a devout, earnest Christian not understanding the terrible happenings in these last days. I mention these things because I want you to note very carefully the following passage of Scripture. There is wisdom hidden here, James said. Let every one of intelligence calculate the Antichrist, the beast number, for it indicates a certain man. Its number is 666, according to Revelation 13 and verse 18. The wisdom hidden here and the intelligence are available to everyone who will ask God for it, according to James 1 and 5. Now the number 666 corresponds with his name, as we're told in Revelation 13 and verse 17, and permits no one to buy or sell anything unless he bears the mark, that is, the Antichrist or the beast name or the number corresponding to his name. Noah Webster says that a name is the title by which any person or thing is known or designated. And then Noah Webster gives us the illustration in his dictionary of Christ's name, saying his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, according to Isaiah 9 and 6. Jesus can be easily identified, according to Revelation 19, because his vesture has been dipped in blood. The blood has always made the difference. It's a mark of distinction. And then Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, 
Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things on earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now the identity of the Antichrist and the false prophet will not be made until the church is gone. The Antichrist is to fulfill 58 prophecies. Antichrist then can easily be identified by his performances. Remember, please, the number is 666, and it corresponds to his name. Now we can readily see that the people who are left behind after the rapture are really going to be up against it. If they do not worship the Antichrist statue, then they'll be put to death. If they do not take the mark of the beast, they'll not be able to buy or sell. Therefore, they will starve to death. If they do bow to the image and take the mark, God says he'll damn their souls for eternity. Our world is even now operating on a numerical system. Once only criminals were known by numbers, but now we have a number for every strata of life. Social Security, automobile operator's license, insurance policies. We have area codes and zip codes. Vehicle registration and labor unions functions are all controlled by numbers. Any and all products on the world markets today must be identified by a union label. It must have a number to identify it or it cannot be sold regardless of price or quality. It appears that Antichrist could fulfill his every known mission by adopting the systems already in operation today. Politically, religiously, and commercially, Antichrist will be an absolute ruling monarch for a season. Could it be that he's already living and his program is even, even now being established? Again, I say beware, lest you too are forced to bow to his image. The wise man said, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for you know not what a day will bring forth. It may be now, or it may be never, to someone listening to my voice. The wise thing for everyone to do is, of course, to take Jesus Christ before it's too late and go with all of the other Christians in the rapture. Then you can say with David of old, The Lord is my shepherd. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. The promise to everyone is this. To as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on the Son hath life, and he that believeth not the Son hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath now everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I beg you in Jesus' name, with all the love of my ransomed soul, call upon him, accept him as Lord and Savior of your life, and accept eternal life that he purchased for you on Calvary, lest that day overtake you as a thief in the night, and you be forced to bow to the image of the Antichrist and have to make a choice to refuse to eat, to refuse to buy or sell without his brand, or else be willing to die for the cause of Christ. My friend, accepting today while there is hope for time and eternity, may God bless you is my prayer.